What is up, people? Welcome back. You've conquered the money market, so what say we learn about one more market in this unit? Brother, can you spare a dime? Or at least a like button smash and a sub? All right, so the loanable funds market is where borrowing takes place. The first thing I want to point out is that loanable funds and money are not the same thing. For example, this $20 bill is money, but it isn't a loanable fund right now because it's not available to be borrowed by anybody. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's talk about this market. In reality, there are multiple different markets for loanable funds and different ways to borrow money. But the loanable funds model represents a simplified market bringing together all borrowers and all savers into a single market. All right, so our x-axis is labeled quantity of loanable funds. Q of LF is totally fine, that's how I'll label it. Importantly, the y-axis is the real interest rate. Our money market model shows the nominal interest rates, but this one shows the real interest rate, which is adjusted for inflation and is therefore the interest rate that borrowers and lenders use to make their decisions. The rest of our model looks refreshingly simple. It's just another supply and demand model, upward sloping supply curve, and a downward sloping demand curve. Let's start with the supply curve. The supply curve represents savers and lenders. We normally think of banks as lenders, which is true, but more importantly, it also represents all the people who have saved their money at the bank. From an economist's perspective, saving and lending is the same thing. Suppose that Pam saves $1,000 at her local bank and Kevin borrows $1,000 from that bank to buy a new drum kit. The bank is the lender, but really they're just an intermediary. It's like Kevin is borrowing Pam's money. The major function of banks is bringing together savers and borrowers in an efficient way. Okay, so the supply curve represents savers and lenders, which we now understand are the same. The supply curve is upward sloping because savers and lenders prefer higher interest rates. The real interest rate is the price of borrowing money. So savers and lenders enjoy receiving a higher real interest rate in return for their money. Before we move on to the demand curve, I need to add a little bit of a wrinkle to the supply, which is that it matters whether we have an open or a closed economy. An open economy trades with other countries while a closed economy does not. The reason this matters is because the supply curve represents savings. So we have to know whether or not people from other countries are able to save their money in this economy. So let's start with a closed economy that does not allow international borrowing and lending. In the absence of international borrowing and lending, national savings is equal to public savings plus private savings. And yeah, I know, I have to define both of those for you. Private savings refer to savings by households, and yeah, I have math for that too. We can also say that private savings equal disposable income minus consumption since the only two things we can do with our disposable income is to either save it or to consume it. Public savings refer to governments and is equal to tax revenue minus government spending. And this number is very often going to be negative since the US federal government has made it a habit to run larger and larger deficits. But anyway, in a closed economy, to find the total supply of savings available, we just add private and public savings. If it's an open economy, the supply of savings is equal to the national savings plus net capital inflows, which is really just a jargony way to describe money being saved internationally. If more people in the US are saving in foreign banks than people from other countries are saving here, then net capital inflows are negative. If more people from other countries are saving here, then net capital inflows are positive. Either way, add that number to the national savings and you get total savings. Remember the savings investment identity, which states that total savings is equal to total investment spending. So be aware that a test question could also phrase this as investment equals national savings plus net capital inflows. The demand curve is much simpler. It just represents borrowers. Borrowers can be individuals, businesses, or governments in need of loanable funds. All borrowers are included in this market, and not surprisingly, borrowers like to pay less to borrow money, so they like lower real interest rates. Therefore, the quantity demanded of loanable funds is greater at lower interest rates than it is at higher interest rates. Okay, so let's talk about shifts of the supply and demand curves. Since we just covered demand, we can stay there and do that first. Something has to happen that makes people want to borrow more or less money 
besides a change in the real interest rate. The first is changes in business opportunities. When businesses and to a lesser extent households are optimistic about future business opportunities, their demand for loanable funds increases, shifting the demand curve to the right and pushing up the real interest rate. When they're pessimistic, the demand for loanable funds decreases. And I think this makes sense, right? If you think the economy is about to go into the toilet, it probably doesn't feel like a great time to open up a second Bob's Burgers location. The other reason has to do with government policy on investment. If the government passes an investment tax credit, it essentially makes it cheaper to borrow money by reducing the taxes a business owes, so the demand for loanable funds increases and shifts to the right. On the other hand, if that tax credit is removed or taxes on investment income are raised, this will shift the demand for loanable funds to the left. Okay, and lastly, the supply curve. Again, something has to make people change their savings behavior besides a change in the real interest rate. One thing is an increase in national income. As long as their NPC stays the same, if a person has more income, then they will save some of that increase. So an increase in national income, aka real GDP, increases the supply of loanable funds, shifting the supply curve to the right and pushing down real interest rates. A decrease in income would shift the supply curve to the left. Or if people's savings behavior itself changed and they saved more or less, then the curve would shift right or left as a result. The big one though is about public savings, the difference between tax revenue and government spending. When a government runs a larger budget deficit, meaning that spending is greater than tax revenue, it reduces public savings, shifting the supply curve to the left and pushing up the real interest rate. We'll deal with this more in Unit 5, but notice that this basically means that the result of expansionary fiscal policy is to raise the real interest rate. On the other hand, if the government raised taxes and reduced its spending, it would run a smaller deficit or even a bigger surplus. And even though we are well into the world of fiction at this point, if this happened, it would shift the supply curve to the right, lowering the real interest rate. Last one is changes in net capital inflows. If more foreigners save their money in the US, the supply curve would shift to the right in the US, lowering real interest rates. And if more Americans chose to save their money in foreign markets, this would decrease the savings here, shifting the supply curve to the left. All right, so that's it for unit four. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, to ring that bell. Check out the description for a link to the answers to these questions as well as the unit notes and a great review book, Macro in 250 Words, and I will see you in the next video.